What a trip is tonight's theme, and thank you for coming to share this with us. And do you know my name is Chantal Freed? You probably did not know that, so I'm willing to tell you that. Um, I'm going to be your host, and I feel very privileged and honored to be here tonight. Part of my what I do on the outside world is I kind of do a dual role at South Mountain Community College. I'm a program coordinator for the Construction Trades Institute, and I'm also part of the South Mountain Community Storytelling Institute, where I get to teach the art of storytelling, which I love. So I'm so excited. And not only that, am I excited to share that with you? Guess what I found out? Any guesses? What? Today is National Take a Walk on the Wild Side. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better host because people know me. I'm a little wild, just a little wild. So um, it works perfectly because we're going to go back to it. I'm going to take you back on a trip. Now, I need to make sure that you're buckled in. So everyone kind of do their buckle. Sir, I don't see you doing your buckle. Uh, yeah, you to your buckle? Because I don't want anyone getting hurt. I mean, I'm on the wild side, but I'm also safety conscious. Okay, so we're going to go back. We're going to go back, and we're going to go back a little further, because this is a traditional oral folk tale that I'm going to tell you, and it happens in England, and it's in a village called Gotham, or Gotham, depending on where you're from. Now, the legend has it that the people, the villagers that live there, their IQ is way up here, except for 12 men who their IQ is be in here, but let me tell you that Gotham also is known for Goat Town. So these 12 men, they are bodaciously bachelors and a little bit on the wild side, they are very bountiful. So they get away with whatever they want and they love to take trips. You're talking trips that may end up for weeks, days, or even a minute. So now the story I'm going to tell you happened on a day that ended with a Y. And there was a time that it took place that had a second, a minute, and an hour. Now these men, these 12 men, they are brawny and big and gorgeous, right? Like I told you. They got up really early. They didn't bathe. They just got up, grabbed their stuff, because they went for a hike. They went for a hike to this most beautiful spot. You know that place, if I tell you to close your eyes and it's like your happy place, that it has just the right smell, maybe it's cinnamon rolls, or it has the right touch, maybe it's a soft cat that you're, or a dog. It just is that place that puts you in the most calm, serene place. Well, these men finally got to that place and it's kind of like the Colorado River because they loved to fish. So if you can imagine the Colorado River, but this was in England, where these trees that was by the river were huge and bushy and big, and as the wind blew, they looked like gorgeous emeralds because the sun would also flicker from the trees, and you could hear the chirp, 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 chirp. And as the water was flowing through, it was like a beautiful, almost harmonious dance that it was doing with the rocks and the fish. Now, the 12 men, some wanted to be inside the water because to touch it, ooh, it was like the perfect temperature, maybe with like four or five ice cubes in it. They had their little, you know, waiter kind of what they considered a waiter shoe, and they got in, they went, because they were more into the fly fishing. And then you had the other half that was on the bank, and they went, really? They were more casters. They just kind of wanted to sit there and take. And they kept talking and laughing and ha, 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 oh my gosh. And anyone that fishes, you know you have to shh to catch the fish. But they didn't care. And they stayed there for hours and hours. And gradually the sun went down. And it started to get that time where they knew they had to come back in. So they all gathered on the bank. And one of the, the, one of the men, he's like, you know, we can't go back. I need to make sure that I count everyone. Okay, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, now, oh, who's missing? Who in the hell is missing? They cussed just a little because they were on the wild side too. 
So the little guy, the one that was the little but he was pretty cute too. He's kind of easy on the eyes. He goes, I'm going to do it. Let me count. Let me count. Let me, let me count. And everyone's like, okay, let's figure this out because who are we missing? One, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven. I mean, this went on for hours. The daytime was almost gone, completely gone. The men were like, oh, my God, we can't hold it. So right then, as all that commotion was going on, the birds were wee, 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 flocking away because of the noise. Nothing wanted to come out because they were scared. There was this traveler walking by. Hey, uh, what's up? Because he heard the noise. And he's seen these not-so-bad-looking men. He's like, mm, why not? What's up? What's going on? And they tried to tell him. And finally, one composed themselves. We started with 12, and we only have 11. I don't know. Can you help, Can you help us? Now, the traveler's like, because he's smart. I mean, he, he may not be up to here, intelligence, IQ, but he's pretty smart. And he's like, well, because he sees six and six. I, I can help you, but... but but what is it for me? Oh, 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 we'll give you, we'll give you anything in our pockets from the fishing lures to, to the worms to all the money we have. <laughs> all the money? Now remember, he's a traveler. All the money? Yes, 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 yes. And some worms? Yeah. Because the little one loved his worms. He's like, yeah. Okay, okay. So they all... Got to calm down, and he goes, one, two, three, and then 10, 11, 12. <laughs> oh my God, they were so happy. They couldn't believe it. They, they were so happy. They were so happy. They stopped crying, and they made it rain, not money. Yes, baby, they did. And that traveler is like, one, two, three, and he kept counting all of his money. Now, I tell you this story because it is about a trip, but I believe when we take our trips, we need to remember that it's very important to count yourself first as number one. And they learn from that day. So in saying this to you, we have our first personal storyteller that I'm going to inter introduce you to. And her name, are we all ready? We're still seatbelted in for these stories because it is what a trip. Or is it, what a trip? Or is it, what a trip? We're going to find out. So the first teller, Vun. <laughs> Did you guys get that reference right? Count Dracula. Uh -huh, okay. Just making sure because I've seen some people smile and I'm like, oh, okay. So the first teller is Pepper Chambers. Pepper is an international actor, writer, producer. She has appeared on stage in New York, L.A., Chicago, Prague, and now here in the Valley. Her most recent performance was from was from where we from where to here a woman one woman show about the 1930s immigration that she wrote. It ran to a sold out audience at the Chandler Museum in August of 2023. One of her most noteworthy performances to date was as Moss in Glenry Glen Ross, which her theater company based in Prague produced in an, with all women in the primary roles. When not on stage, Pepper is writing plays, films, and novels. Her novels, um, Harlem's Last Dance and Harlem's Awakening, can be ordered wherever you buy books. Let me just show these to you real quick. In case you have some money and want to make it rain. <laughs> just joking. So please welcome up Pepper. Hi. Um, Stacy. do you want to do the land acknowledgement still? Okay. We'll take a moment. Sure.
Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Já jsem Pepš. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pepper. In 2014, I took a trip to the Czech Republic. Uh, I was living in Los Angeles, and my book had just come out, Harlan's Last Dance. And my friend Nicole, who is also director, suggested that we turn it into a one-woman show. And we did. And we submitted it to the Prague Film Festival. Not Film Festival, the Prague Theater Festival. And uh, we were accepted. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves raising money to get to the Czech Republic, because we certainly couldn't afford to get there on our own. So at the time, I didn't know where the Czech Republic is. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't know where it was. But we got there, and it was fantastic. The Czech people were fantastic. Um, the show won awards, and we had a great time. We were absolutely hooked. Now, I always thought I would live abroad, but I thought I would live in France because I studied French. You know, je parle français, j'étudie français, je parle français un peu. I figured I would live in France. So all of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm like, Czech Republic? So in 2015, I moved to the Czech Republic. Nicole did too. And to be honest, we needed a change. Nicole was going through a divorce, and I was having an early to midlife crisis, we'll call it. So there we were living abroad in the Czech Republic. And it was amazing. Um, I taught Anglitsky to adults. I taught Divadlo to Dieti, so I taught theater to children. Nicole and I created a, a, a theater company, as you heard, and it was called Catnip Divadlo. So Catnip stood for Contemporary American Theater, now in Prague. Catnip Divadlo. And uh, we still have it. <laughs> and so we had that. And we were just living this beautiful life. And I learned, I learned to, you know, order food, like coffee and cake and check. So, dobry den. Dam si kavu mali prosim i taki morunka, kolačku morunko. Daku. It was basically, I'll have a small coffee with a peach cake. You know. So I'm in Czech Republic. I'm learning the language, and I'm doing as the Czechs do. And one thing that the Czechs do very well is they relax. They sit in the park, and they enjoy the nature. They sit by the river, the Plavka, sit on the edge, legs hanging over the side, sunset. You drink your pivo, which is beer, or maybe slivovice, which is kind of homemade, you know, moonshine. In the fall, you drink birchok, which is new wine, and they put it in these uh, soda, like plastic soda bottles, and it's just, it's delightful. And in a year, my shoulders dropped from being way up here while being in Los Angeles and the stress of traffic on the 405 and working three jobs to pay rent and being afraid of danger in every lurking corner from sunrise to sunset. I adapted. That's what you do when you get to a foreign country, right? You adapt. So one day I decided, not decided, but you know, my friends were having drinks. We decided to go for cocktails. And I don't know if you guys know this, but the Czech Republic is known, specifically Prague, I believe, is known for its beer. And I think they might be the number one like consuming population of beer, Pivo, just a fantastic, I love beer. And, but man almighty, do you sometimes want a cocktail? Sometimes, like please, where's a Manhattan? So we had a group of friends and we'd get together and go to this cocktail bar, and, cocktail bar, and it was an area called Stardi Mesto. Um, by the way, has anyone been to Czech Republic or been to Prague? I didn't even ask. Oh, hi, honey. So um, it's in Stari Mesto, which is called the Old Town. And I'm meeting with all these expats. And we're from different countries and different ethnicities. And what we have in common is we're all teaching English. We're a little bit broke. And we have Prague. And I told you I was going through a bit of a midlife crisis. So I'm like 10 to 15 years older than all these 20 and 30-year-olds who are finding their midlife crisis early. And so we're hanging out. I'm having a great time. We're having our chocolate martinis. And after the third one, I'm like, guys, I got to go. 
I got to get my beauty sleep. I, I got to be in front of people, adults, <laughs> conjugating verbs in the morning. I can't be here all night. So I leave. And I walk out into the beautiful the night. I just love the nighttime there. It's so peaceful and calming and wonderful. And like the moonlight, which I think in Czech was mesh, mesh, sweet. I can't remember. But the moonlight is there. And it feels like the castles are just sort of sprinkling this peace around the city. It was such a treat to just walk. So I leave the bar and I'm walking. I've got 15 minutes to get to my flat. And I get to the bridge that goes over the Naplavka Rivkar. My bridge was called uh, Yarovsky Most. The Yarovsky Most is the bridge name. And um, I take like three, three steps and all of a sudden I hear, this man is here behind me. And I'm like, what, what do you? And he's grabbing my purse because my purse was just hanging there so calmly and freely. And he grabbed my purse, and I'm going, nay, nay, nay. And then I try. And he laughed at me. And he laughed at me. And he laughed at me. And I watched him run down the bridge with his backpack just bobbing up and down. And I figured, I want to yell at him in Czech, but I can't find the words, and I can't advance. And so I yell at him, you coward. I found myself alone on the bridge, silhouetted in the moonlight. And so I started running, and I ran the three blocks home to my street, Matoshova, and I took my skeleton key, and I turned it in the heavy door lock, and I ran up my three marble steps into my flat, and I fell onto my bed relieved that all that had happened was a trip. But still, I felt so incredibly torn. Thank you. What an incredible story. I mean, it took you from here to there and the trip and just the hero's journey piece of it. Thank Excellent. Thank you. So the question I want to ask you is what, how you tell your story, what is most enjoyable for you? Uh, the enjoyable part the most is um, I, I did study acting, so bringing in, um, bringing in the theatrical element, and this one, of course, you know, it, it's got its moments. So having the courage to go back to that time and really feel what I was feeling and, and convey it to you guys. Okay, this is a little tall for me. But anyway, for the next storyteller, who will this will be perfect for, her name is, now we're on storytelling. Ooh, ha, ha. Can I hear the ha, ha? Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Hamid is her name. And I've practiced this all night because I didn't want to mess it up because it's such a beautiful name. She is a PhD candidate and National Science Foundation graduate research fellow in the geographical sciences in the School of Earth and Space Exploration um, at ASU. Her research involves studying volcanoes on Mars to explore how eruptions can help us understand a planet's atmosphere, climate, and surface environment. After, graduate, after she graduates, she hopes to study the volcanic eruptions can impact the biological cycle of Earth and other planets. If that doesn't work out, she'll want to become, starts with an A, an astronaut. Yes. Welcome up our second teller. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, as stated, my name is Saira Hamid, uh, fifth year PhD candidate, uh, study rocks on different planets, and 
Um, in particular, like stated, I study how volcanoes affect the atmosphere, climate, and surface geology of different worlds. And for my dissertation, I'm focused on studying Mars. And usually when I tell people about what it is I study, I get met with one or two different reactions. The first one is intrigue, and then the second one is just pure confusion as to why I would study something like that. You know, what is the point? You know, why, why should we care about studying these other worlds? And, you know, we have all these things going on here on Earth. And I understand the sentiment, you know, I have asked myself that as well. Why, why am I studying what I study? What is the point? Well, one of the, my most favorite things about what it is I study is that it can take me to the craziest places across the world. Uh, recently, I just finished a transatlantic research cruise. Uh, I embarked on a research cruise across the Atlantic Ocean to study dust from the Sahara Desert and how it gets transported through the atmosphere. And so I know I just mentioned I study volcanoes on Mars, and now I'm talking about I study dust from the Sahara Desert, but I promise they're all related somehow. Uh, it turns out that dust is very similar to volcanic ash in terms of, of its physical properties. So understanding dust on Earth can help us understand dust and also volcanic ash on Mars. And during the cruise, I, I learned that these little particles of dust that come from the Sahara Desert can actually have very profound impacts on the Earth's environment in ways that aren't immediately obvious. For example, the dry air that encapsulates this dust and transports it across the atmosphere from the Sahara Desert, this dry air creates a dry and stable environment over the Atlantic Ocean, and it, it can actually inhibit the formation of thunderstorms in the Atlantic Ocean. And as a result, it can also inhibit the formation of tropical storms and hurricanes from reaching you know, the coastlines of the Americas potentially saving thousands of lives. In addition, you can also have the Saharan dust stimulate primary productivity in the ocean. So what does that mean? Uh, essentially, if you were to go out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you might notice that it's pretty barren out there in terms of the life that's present. Because compared to the coastlines, the middle of the ocean actually doesn't have enough nutrient sources for life to actually thrive out there. But if you find yourself out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you would notice that there are these large patches of seaweed distributed all throughout the water and also flying fish present as well. And the seaweed is known as sargassum and what's interesting about it is that it can serve as home, a sort of breeding ground or a refuge for life in the ocean such as flying fish. And so here you have another example of how, you know, this dust can promote and protect life on Earth. But then also this dust can act as a taker of life as well. Opportunistic pathogens such as bacteria, viruses, fungi can actually latch onto this dust and get transported uh, through the atmosphere. And upon landing, it could lead to the death of sea fan populations in the ocean. And then if it lands on our skin, for example, it could lead to skin infections. Or, for, or if you were to inhale it, it could lead to a host of other infections, such as like brain infections for uh, immunocompromised individuals. And so while this dust can seemingly provide, you know, all the ingredients for life to thrive. It can also take that away. And volcanic eruptions are very similar to dust in that respect. You, over the course of human history, it's been well documented how explosive or just volcanic eruptions in general can lead to the destruction and devastation of entire communities. 
Uh, take, for example, the city of Pompeii hundreds of years ago. Uh, the, total, the whole city was totally destroyed because of volcanic eruptions. But then on the other hand, you have volcanic ash, which, which could serve as a nutrient source for microorganisms in the soil. You know, this volcanic ash could fertilize the soil. So there are, there are multiple different pathways that, you know, these different processes can take, and it can affect life in multiple different ways. And there's sort of a beauty in it all, if you think about it. The world is filled with chaos and order, and here we are, as people, in the midst of it all, trying to understand our place in this world, and just trying to survive. And to me, it's very profound and very humbling. And this trip has, a, has reinforced this idea that this separation that I think of between myself as a person, as a human being, and the natural world around me is simply an illusion. When uh, many people might think of human as being separate from nature. You know, we, we have our problems here that we have to worry about, and you know, there's no way that processes on the other side of the planet, let alone the other side of the universe, can actually meaningfully impact my life in any way. You know, I think it's very easy to fall into this mindset where you're alienated from the world around you. But that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, we are just as much this planet as the ocean, as dust from the Sahara Desert, as volcanic ash. And we are just as much of the universe as the stars, our sun, the planet Mars. And what's great about it is that we're the thinking and feeling parts. So we can think about all the things that we learned, all the knowledge that we've gained, and reflect on it, and think about how it makes us feel as people in this giant world. And to me, that's, that's very profound. And when I think about When I think about the, sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought in the midst of it all. But when I think about the, um, the connection that my work gives me, it has reinforced a certain sentiment that I still carry to this day. The idea the idea of the separation between us, not only is it a, an illusion, but you can start to think of yourself in this world from a whole different perspective. When I think about the work I do, you know, I think it's a very humbling experience because it gives me the sense of oneness with the world around me. And it gives me a different perspective in looking at life. It makes me think, of the world as an extension of myself, rather than me being a separate being, you know, with my own issues that have no impact on the world around me. And I think about, when I think about the world being an extension of me, I think about, it's a part of me that I want to understand, the world is a part of me that I want to explore, and the world is a part of me that I would like to protect. And so when I think about what is the point of it all, why do I do what I do, it's, it's to think about how our connection to the world makes us more human. And by extension, in my opinion, it's an act of self-love. And in losing that sight, in losing that insight into our connection to the world around us, we become less human, and we begin to fall out of love with ourselves. Thank you. You did a great job. Didn't she do a great job? I mean, I didn't know. I was like...
Thank you. Oh, my God. So one question that I'm going to keep it the same so it's kind of fair. What do you enjoy most about your storytelling style and how you tell your story? Hmm. Well, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I'm so used to giving... <laughs> I, I am so used to giving scientific talks where I have a PowerPoint slide behind me <laughs> and I can never forget anything I want to talk about. So um, I, I hope uh, the story felt like conversational and friendly and less like you're being talked to by a speaker and more like you're just talking to one of your peers. Um, I try to make my stories and my talks a little bit relatable. So. I, <laughs> I hope that came across well. Yeah. Be smarter than memorizing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So now as, an, as a teacher of the art of storytelling, we had two very prime examples of different storytelling types but a common thread of a hero's journey, right? You had the first story who brought in foreign language, but because of how she expressed herself in her story, you knew she was passionate or kind of what she was conveying to you. And then the second, I'm the fact base of how she told us facts and then still incorporated that personal hero's journey. They both had the hero's journey, right? Which is brilliant. And I've enjoyed listening to both of them. So now, do you know what number we're on as a personal storyteller? Three. Oh, I love it. You're never going to look at Count Dracula the same. <laughs> I know. I like Count Dracula. So our teller is Louis Flores. And I've had the beautiful opportunity to actually meet all three of these lovely um, uh, guest tellers tonight. And I'll tell you, each of them have their own unique personality. And Louis's personality just shines. Like, you wait. He won't even need the spotlights when he comes up here. He's just going to shine. Let me give you a little bit about him. Louis is a former federal government firefighter, hot shot squad leader. He has now been, right? I was like, dang, living on the wild side, okay. He has now been an employee for ASU for 30 years. Louis is a multiple award-winning author, artist, illustrator. His indie self-published children's interactive book, Big Love, and companion coloring book can be found at the Amazon or Barnes Nobles for purchase. Oh, make it rain, make it rain. Big Love was a finalist for a 2023 International Book Award in children's nonfiction. He is also known as the Pavement Picasso for his skilled in chalk art drawings. So let's give him a warm welcome, Louie. Hello, hello. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. Uh, I just went shopping, so that's why the, the, the bag, all right? <laughs> a, quick, um, a quick show of hands. How many of you are uh, related, or not related, but uh, affiliated with Arizona State University, either online classes or what have you? Okay, so there's a few of you. Uh, the, the reason I say that, I have something that I did go shopping for you guys at the end of the Q&A, and I will present that with you guys, okay? But uh, since, uh, since there was that group of people, I do have something for everybody in the, in the um, venue, even the technicians back there, and it goes something like this. <clears throat> Girl devils! <laughs> now, <laughs> My, my story is a true story from Arizona State University from the 2020 pandemic. Um, as you know, it was, it was a strange time. It was a strange um, feeling, if you would. Everybody was quarantined. Um, the governor told the university, you're going to furlough 95% of the people or your staff. 5% uh, of the staff that was there, we're all looking at each other like, whoa, what the hell now, you know? And then they're, they're saying... Um, from that 5%, they, the, the upper management came down and said, whoever has any corporate maladies or health issues or are close to retirement, start exiting. We will expedite your papers. We lost two more percent. So from 7,000 employees, maintenance employees, we were down to a few hundred for the entire campus and 4.5 miles of tunnels. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, 
when we, uh, when we shut down the campus, there was some people going around. We, I, I called them marauders because that's what they were doing, uh, vandalizing, doing stupid things around campus. And if you know or if you remember how, um, how everything was in shortage, remember that? Uh, you couldn't find food. You couldn't find nothing. So my, my friend, my coworker, called me and said, hey, Louie, I need some help. There's some trouble over here in Life Science Ewing. I'll be right there. When I, when I pulled up, I heard some commotion in the bathrooms, both men's and women's. I said, uh, oh, hold, keep, keep the door open. I went in there. I busted the door open. I said, what the hell's going on? I said, you, 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 you need to leave. I said, well, who are you? I said, well, I'm ASU. You have no business being in here. What are you doing? Well, who are you? I said, I, I am ASU. I just called the police. They're underway. You got two minutes to leave. Go. So they did. I'm like, wow. I thought I was going to have to fight them right there. <laughs> so anyway, this is what they were stealing, and, and I should have sold this on eBay. Check it out. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> now, do I hear 10 bucks back there? 10 bucks, 15, 15, 20, 20. I heard 20. Sold. You bought it. <laughs> so in, anyway, that was, that was crazy to me. Um, the, 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 the basic... The basic toilet paper was in such commodity. I broke up several fights at Fry's, at Walmart. It's like, guys, it's not worth it. Come on, you know, you're fighting over toilet paper. Yeah, but it's mine, it's mine. I was like, grab your Charmin and leave, you know. So my, uh, my friend, which, uh, by the way, he passed away during coronavirus, a 20-year friend of mine. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was sad. I, um, I went into the manhole covers with the uh, ASU Bio Research Building. They said, we need sewage samples. It's like, well, why the hell you come to me? You know, send, send somebody else. And well, your senior staff, we need you to go in there. I said, what is this about? Well, we need to collect for the PPMs. Once again, what the hell's a PPM? Parts per million. On what? Coronavirus, that's what they were trying to track. And, and, and they did. By the way, um, ASU Bio Research, came up with the antidote for the Ebola virus. So they came up with the rapid saliva test. And that was their guinea pig. <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I was taking the sewer samples. And this still gets me to this date. So if you excuse me if uh, I go a little astray. I was in the manhole covers with full, full hazmat suits. I took a shower. I disinfected. I put the clothes in, in the bag. And then uh, I went to the gym and took another shower, another clothes in the bag. And uh, you have to understand, back in my house, I had a whole house full of people, from uh, my grandchildren to my elderly mom. And um, I, I felt, um, I felt dirty, man. I felt, uh, I felt contag contagious. And I could not help my feeling of me going back to my house and giving this to my family. Take, take me, Lord. I chose this. Take me. Don't, don't let me give them this dreaded disease. They're, they're not at fault. Anyway, my uh, nephew, Zachary, he comes out. Well, oh, be, before I say that, I, I drove up in my truck, and I immediately I could hear mariachi music. My mom loves mariachi music, and I could see people dancing in the silhouettes through the, uh, the curtains, and I could smell my mom's cooking. My, my uh, nephew, Zachary, <clears throat> comes out with a garbage bag. Says, everybody, Uncle Louie's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody goes to the door. And they're rushing through. My grandchildren, <laughs> my, my, my grandchildren went through the people's legs. And I yelled at them, stop. Don't touch me. Get, be, get away from me. And they still didn't understand why I was doing that. And it still affects me. 2020 realigned me. It made me see things totally different, completely different. So as, as luck would have it, I got a call from the university. You need to go back. There was a big, uh, a major pipe break at the stadium. I got back to the stadium. I, I got the pipe. I shut it off, bagged it, tagged it. I'm going to log it. I told Barry, the security guard, a good friend of mine, he said, Barry, I need some time to myself. Is it okay if I go to the field? I said, Louie, this is your house. I said, thank you, bro. So I went down there. I went mid, about midfield. I took a knee, and I asked for guidance. I asked for 
uh, some kind of reflection, some kind of answers. Anyway, when I got back to the house, my next door neighbor, this was already coming down about six, seven o'clock in the morning because I worked all the way night through. And I got back to my house and my neighbor, his son, was having a birthday party and, and he was very upset. My neighbor was outside and said, hey, Louie, uh, you know, my, my son's having a birthday in quarantine. What, what the hell kind of birthday is that? I said, oh, bro, I, I, I had my own little meltdown a while ago too. Can I do something for you? I said, yeah, what's that? I know uh, little, little Joe likes uh, uh, gamers, right? Said, yeah, let me draw a, uh, a birthday cake and a controller for him. So I did. I started drawing a birthday cake and a controller. And I could see the, 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 because he's got four kids and some of the kids were crying and jumping up and down and the mom was crying. Now, Paul was crying too, like, what the hell's going on? And then that's when I saw it. That's when it hit me. Anybody know what that was? The huge demand for hope. That's when I saw it. And then that's when I went back to the university and I started drawing big eagles on the, on the campus. Uh, 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 messages of hope and love. Uh, I, I saw that uh, hate and despair was starting to creep in and uh, everybody was getting on each other's nerves because they were scared. We were all scared. We were all scared. So anyway, I started drawing this. The local media got a hold of this and David Capiano was the, uh, the reporter. I'm good friends of him with him now. And uh, he came out and said, hey, are you drawing? These are great. He's almost like a, like a pigment Picasso. I said, hey, I'm going to use that, bro. I'm going to take that. I'm going to run with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I did, and they, they interviewed me, and um, what ensued after that, he, he, he's the one that said, you should do something with these drawings, some kind of book, some kind of maybe a coffee book or a children's book or whatever. Uh, remember when I said who was uh, affiliated with ASU a little while ago? Well, I, I do have some books for 10 people in the audience. Signed by me today, okay? That is my ASU story. You can't have the toilet paper. That's mine. That's my, I fought for that one. What did I tell you about Louie, right? I mean, aren't you glad you were seatbelt in for his story? Great story. I just love this story Thank and your you. emotions and how you brought us there. What do you enjoy about how you tell your story when you're, when you're sharing it with everyone. The free toilet paper from campus. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it would have to be the way that I was realigned. Now I see things differently and I like to spread that. Uh, uh, love and hope will always win over hate and despair. And I do truly believe in my heart of hearts that there are more good people than bad because I saw it firsthand. Thank you. So we've come to the part where um, we're going to allow question and answer time to our fabulous people. And if you have anything for me, too, I'll be happy to share. So we'll give, me, give you a moment to think about it while we get everyone back on stage. And please feel free to applaud, throw us money, food, if it's prepackaged, um, anything like that. Um, thank you. All right, they assembled very quickly, didn't they? So the first question that is actually for all of us, um, did you know exactly which story you had to share for tonight's theme? What a trip is our theme, obviously. Or did you have to think on it for a while before it came to you? Um, for me, thank you all for coming, first of all. It was really nice to pr uh, present and be with you guys tonight. Um, so I would say it did, it came, I had a feeling, I, would, I thought about the word trip and rather than thinking about my trip to the Czech Republic, I was like, oh, what about that time when you actually tripped? <laughs> and I also thought, I meant to mention this, but hold on one sec. 
I brought, uh, the Czech Republic has a lot of cobblestones. The streets are made out of cobblestones, and I have this on my desk, and you would trip over these all the time. Because, you know, you can't wear heels. It's, you have to wear sneakers because you trip. And so that inspiration, it, it did come to me uh, pretty quickly, so. Uh, for me, when Stacy reached out to me to uh, tell the story, I knew exactly what I wanted to tell because uh, I, I think I had either just started my transatlantic cruise or I just got back. So I was like, okay, this is the trip I have to talk about. It's perfect timing. And I had like very profound experience while I, while I was there. So I was really honored to have the opportunity to talk about it here. Yeah, sorry. What about you, Louie? Well, talk about <laughs> trip. Oh my God. Uh, uh, 2020 was just a total trip. Um, um, what I saw there on campus and what we experienced and all the, the, the division that we were going through, not, not just on campus, but the political theater was going the same thing. And um, to be able to um, actually do something, uh, uh, somebody was telling me, hey, well, you're a firefighter. So yeah, what was that got anything to do with it? But once a fire, always a firefighter. That's always been in the back of my mind. And to be able to actually reach out and touch people not only in quarantine, but even now, I, I get requests to go and draw something on their driveways and something, you know, for an anniversary or a party or what have you. And to be uh, um, tagged a payment Picasso, that was just uh, that was just amazing to me. So for me, as a teacher, I have a wealth of uh, resources. And Liz Warren, the director, I go into and I'm like, look, I've got invited. I feel honored. I really want to give them something that would be fun with the theme. And so she, um, she always does, we have an international travel for um, the Art of Storytelling where you can go to Ireland. And she goes, I got one for you. And it's literally th like this, like that much reading. And I'm like, oh, okay, I got to make it a little bit more. So, um, which is, I don't know what's harder, telling folk base or fact base, or, you know, folk tales or the personal piece, because you always have to allow yourself to have that personality show. All right, next question. Are you ready? Yes. Louie. Yes. Yes. Are you it ready? Me. It wasn't me. Well, it wasn't me. Say, I, swear. I, have, I wasn't even close to that. I do have 10 bucks for toilet paper, though. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm well, she already bought it for 20. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who? A man that carries his own role. I mean, that is a husband to be or a husband. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. There we go. Oh, Grandpa. Oh, yeah, you're Grandpa. That's right. Okay. We would like to know a little bit more about your payment Picassos. Like, what was the first picture? that you wanted, that you saw, and then did you just go buy the crayons? Did you have the crayons, the crayons inspired, or not crayons, the chalk? Like, oh, what glad, was it? I'm glad you said that, because uh, remember when I said that um, um, I pulled up in the driveway and I was listening, I was listening to the mariachi music and all that, the day before, uh, I had a house full of people, and they, uh, they felt comfortable in my house. Um, I walked in, this is right the, the day right before all that happened, uh, the, my breakdown, um, my Older sister yell at me, hey, where's, where's the chalk at? Well, it was right by the garage. Go back to Walmart and get some more. Said, yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. So I went, I went and grabbed the last four boxes of chalks that were at Walmart. So I put them in the back of my truck. When I got home, uh, the, the kids were outside. Yeah, yeah, Louis, oh, he's got the chalk. So I reached out to, to my truck. When I pulled two of the bag, the two bags, they, they broke. So the four boxes fell and chalk everywhere, like, oh, figures. So I'm picking chalk up. I said, kids, come on, help me. And so they, they grabbed the three boxes. I grabbed a handful of chalk, and I had some chalk left on my, uh, in, in the back of my seat. So the next day when, uh, when I was uh, relaying the information from the fire department, they told me, uh, social distance, you're six feet, it is airborne. And I did tell them that, but then at that point it was, a, no, no, it's not. You can't divulge that information. Anyway, um, we had our meetings outside. We were, we were the first group to have our meetings outside. I said, look, look what they're doing. Is it so everybody started doing that. And that's, that's when, uh, you know, I figured out. That, so did you figure anything out? Somebody told me, did you figure anything out, Louis? And, well, no, how come I got to, I'll be right back. There he goes again. <laughs> so I ran, I ran to my truck, and I grabbed the three pieces of chalk that were there. I can't remember what color, blue, red, whatever it was. I started drawing a big old car-sized eagle, but it was lopsided. It was weird. But the, the men in the circle were seeing what I was doing. They're like, oh, Okay. So one of the uh, main uh, managers came outside and said, well, what's going on over there? Who the hell's flopping around on the, on the ground having a heart attack? <laughs> oh, that's Louie again doing this drawing. <laughs> so 
this is, this is how that came to be. When, when I do that, uh, my, my friend uh, uh, Billy, he went and grabbed the AC truck, the big truck, the, the four-door truck, the one that's got the nice speakers. So he, he cranked out some Van Halen. And said, yeah, we're, we're, we're jamming. And now, now we got something. Now we right. got something. Right. Instead, of hate, instead of despair, now we got, yeah, we got, we got unity. We got strength. We got love. We got hope. And from there, it just snowballed. Oh, to, that's, to great. Where I got now. that's great. Because the energy with the music and the energy that you're probably giving right then and there with your picture, like it just came alive. Right, exactly. I love that. Exactly. Love that. Right? That is such a great story and insight. Thank you. You're welcome. You. Now, are you ready to answer a question? Okay. Sure. We would like to know, your research sounds fascinating, like really fascinating. When did you first know that geological science, sciences, and vol volcanic ology were what you wanted to pursue? Well, around my freshman year of undergrad, I just started having an epiphany about how much I love nature and love learning. And I just had this fascination with wanting to find all the answers to all my questions about how all of these landforms around us have formed, from landforms on Earth to landforms on other planets as well. And I took a geol I was actually a journalism major. Oh, okay. And <laughs> nothing against journalism, but I just I just chose it just because like I didn't know what I didn't know you were allowed to be undecided as a major. So I just chose something. And it didn't really connect with me at that time. And I had to take a science requirement. And um, so I decided to take geology because it seemed the easiest <laughs> out of all of them. <laughs> and then, and then uh, we got to the volcanology yeah. section and then I was just like, wow, it's actually amazing how, how uh, fundamental volcanic processes are in shaping a planet. And I just thought it was so interesting because you can, you know, not only study the rocks that come from volcanoes, but you can study how volcanoes affect the climate, um, how volcanoes affect the atmosphere. And, and it just led to all these possibilities to understanding how a planet works. And so, yeah. I love it. I love your excitement and your passion about it. And when you're talking about that, because uh, backstage we were thinking about, because the pepper, right, for hot, the hot chili pepper, and him being the fireman, right, the hot, and we're like, ah, oh, volcano hotness now. Okay, I got you, girl. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yes. I am. You sure? Yes. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. You are an author. Yes. On top of your theater, theatrical talents. Yes. What made you want to write your own two no novels about Harlem? Ah, uh, thank you. Um, so yes, I love words. And uh, not that you don't, I'm being funny. So my books, Harlem's Awakening and Harlem's Last Dance were actually came from, I created, when I got to LA, I created a 1940s dinner theater show, which would be amazing in this type of space. And so the, that was called Harlem's Night. And the story was about looking for love in all the wrong places, which is what I was doing. <laughs> and so I, I just love words. And I was like, well, I love having the thing that's on the stage. But my real love was like, oh, but what if I have a book that people could take home with them after the show? And, and I did write my first book when I was, I used to write short stories and poems when I was little. So I know that writing was always in me. But the impulse for these stories were based upon the dinner theater show and me wanting to continue the story off the stage. And, um, and I always knew it'd be a, tri a trilogy and I'm working on the third one right now. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Thank you. Well, we've answered some questions now. I think it's the audience chance if they'd like to ask anything. That's all right. Trippy. It's a trip. It's a trip. <laughs> How thematic. I'll save you. I'll save you. <laughs> <laughs> Always the Clip. fireman. Clip. There you go. <laughs> Terrific. I wanted to know what drew you to the storytelling center at South Mountain Community College. Oh, me? What? 
Everybody. Oh, well, you're from, all there. For me, we actually, my husband's military and he's retired, so we were in Germany and I was so cold. It was always so cold and I wanted the hottest place that we could go. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I love 113 degrees, people. I'm just saying, I don't know. So um, we started driving around and I fell in love with the beauty of the campus by the South Mountain. It's the history of it and the richness of it and the actual blend of the community that lives there. Um, and then we started, you know, registering for classes and we're like, art is storytelling, what's that about? You know, because everyone's a storyteller and everyone has a toolbox, but you gotta fine tune those tools in that box to, you know, really pull in the, your voice because our stories are powerful. And if we can't articulate them in a manner to get our point across and to tell our children and our children's children and the family members, they die. You know, there's nothing left. So that's what drew me there. It's just the beauty, and the people are so nice. So that was me. Um, for South Mountain, I'm learning about it for the first time, but for here, for today, I had the pleasure to get to know um, Stacey and Tracy. And then I looked on the website, and I was like, oh, this looks like fun, you know? <laughs> and so I asked, it was a mutual, maybe, I don't know. But I, it was through my relationship with them, and that's how I ended up here today. Yeah, uh, for me, I was actually invited to give a talk, um, and I'd be curious to ask Stacy what made her <laughs> want to want to invite me. I'm very flattered, and um, I'm very happy I came to give a talk. I didn't actually know that there were these storytelling events going on before this, so now that I know, I hope to be involved in future ones. Huh, well, let's see, with me, my boss told me, you over there, you're going to get overtime. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I'm getting paid for this? I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, 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 the thing with that is um, I, I, really, I, really don't, uh, I really don't care about the monetary gains anymore because I was a contractor also, contracting houses, rebuilding houses, remodeling houses. Uh, Amazon rejected my book twice because of the low price that I put on it. And uh, I said, well, then you give me a price that you make your profit because I don't care about the profit. My, what, what the message in my book may spread faster than the pandemic that started it. That's what I want. Anyone else? More questions? Did you ever get your purse back? Yes. It's here. Oh. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Actually, you asked, it, I, it was, he never got it. Because I had it here like this, and so, and then when I fell, I had it, and I, I still have it, and that was, it was in 2015 or so, and I, I haven't let it go. There's a smudge where I fell. I'm glad, I'm glad you got a brick in it now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm safe now. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah. I was really going to say, I really liked about all the stories. It's almost like you ended the stories, yours in particular, they had, it was almost like you had uh, left the viewer hanging, like right at the end. And the same thing with Louis's story, I, I think. And it's like, I was gonna, this sort of goes into, I wanted to ask you one, one or two. Uh, did you, uh, what was the parts per million that you ended up f finding in the sewer? And, and also I wanted to ask uh, before I, uh, what was the design that you actually put on the, on the campus, because I was kind of confused. The design that inspired the hope for the people, I, I didn't really quite catch that. You're very, uh, you're very you're perceptive. Um, you're absolutely right. I did leave it like a cliffhanger because there is yeah. so much more to <laughs> that. I just, I just scratched the it's surface on that one. A good story. It's a Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was designed that way. <laughs> no, it just, it just happened. Uh, I stumble on things sometimes. But the, the, the parts per, per million was interesting because, uh, like I was saying, the um, ASU Bio Research Building, they, they have all these hazmat. So it's like a movie out of uh, Outbreak or that, that one movie. And, and with, with the little lights and everything, they say, well, this one fits you, Louis. Like, oh, man. And, and I really felt, uh, uh, I really felt vulnerable at that particular moment in time when I came out of the manhole and I, I gave him the 12 samples. Now the parts per million was uh, say a wing uh, a student complex is uh, 12,000 parts or, or 12 million parts per, I can't remember what it was, uh, uh, a million gallons 
because it's it's big sewer pipes. It's a 16-inch sewer pipe, so a million gallons goes through there, you know, within an hour, if that. Uh, and uh, you go to the Memorial Union Hall where they all congregate. That one was 75 parts per million. So now now they're they're tracking. Okay, well, this is more concentrated, this is not, this is, this is, and they started tracking it and they pinpointed it to where they would congregate the, the students and now uh, they could track it and they, they extrapolated that information and made a saliva test for us and, and like I said, I was, I was the guinea pig. I said, I was tested every two days. I said, you need to come back in. I said, okay, okay. In incidentally, and I'm not bragging about this, I am very grateful and humbled because all the 22 men that was in my zone, in my area, everybody got coronavirus, COVID, Delta, Omicron at some point in time. I never tested positive. So go, go figure, yeah. It must have been all that alcohol I was drinking. That's why I don't drink anymore. <laughs> it's, it's on part two. Thank you, thank you. Oh right, right. Sorry, but yes, yeah, the, the the big eagle. It was, it was a, I, I, the very first drawing that I did was for my neighbor Paul and his son, the the birthday cake with the controller. But the the one that I did at the campus was that eagle, the lopsided eagle, when we were all gathered outside, uh, uh, space, uh, uh, social distancing space, and I was drawing the eagle. Like I said, it was all, all lopsided and stuff. But then uh, Billy came around with the, with the big truck, and that really put the puzzle pieces to, together. Now. Now we can see going forward in strength and not in defeat. We had hope, not despair. And we, we, we came together as a unit. Uh, what I decided to do, I said, we, we have radios, not, not just the, the, the cell phones. We have old school radios from the police department. Ace who has their own the police department. I told them, give us 10 radios. I need 10 radios for my crew. I put together a crew of men to where whoever responded to a building from now on, we all respond. I don't care if it's a plug toilet or somebody trying to break in. We all respond. There's strength in numbers, and that worked out perfect. Mm -hmm. So it was like a bald eagle? Uh, I'm yes, sure. yeah, uh, 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 a hawk, an eagle. Uh, yes, yes, it was just something that I, that I was thinking in my mind, big old feathers, it probably, probably like a lopsided pigeon. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 the, 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 the point of the... Yeah, big bird. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sesame Street, exactly. thank you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> but that, that's, uh, that's what came, the, the very first drawing was that. The drawings after that, then I took my time and, you know, and did, did those right. So, Syra, since Mars is your field of study now, and since you want to be an astronaut, two questions. Do you think you'll get to go there in your lifetime or after? I don't know. And do you want to? Hmm, I, okay, bad news. I, I'm a little pessimistic about us getting to Mars in my lifetime. I think a more likely candidate would be the moon or the International Space Station, which is still cool in its own right. Um, and as for if I would want to go to Mars, if, yes, if the reason is right. So if we're going there to, you know, answer some long-standing scientific mystery, then absolutely, I would love to. Um, and as long as the mission is focused around science and having us understand uh, the geology of that world more, I would love to, you know, go to Mars. But whether or not that will happen in my lifetime, I don't know. A little controversial, but um, space mining, space tourism, not a huge fan of those things. Um, I, I just rather, I'd rather the reason we explore be for trying to find a deeper knowledge of the world it is we're studying and ourselves by extension. And I'm not sure that the other two reasons for going to these worlds would benefit us as much as a species as the other, my primary reason for going would be. <laughs> okay, so, I, everybody's a storyteller. I am a storyteller, love stories. 
Um, my question for all four of you is what was your favorite story growing up and who told you that story? Oh, so me, for me, my favorite story was, um, um, well, there was two of them, uh, the Jolly Green Giant, or, yeah, the Jolly Green Giant, right? Well, I guess I remember more the, the time I spent with my dad rather than the actual story because it was a pop-up book where we'd, we'd push him back, but he would, he was a truck driver, so when we, when we got to see him, his hands were always, like, really rough because he'd break his truck and he'd load his truck, so when he'd come home... He wouldn't go take a shower or anything. He'd wash his hands and he'd grab the book and he would tell me the stories. So I think, um, I think rather than a specific story, it was just being that time with my dad and hearing him. So, but I remember the green giant. <laughs> maybe he was the green giant. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know maybe. <laughs> That's such a great question. And what came to me is my mom, um, she's still with us, so I say used to when I was little, she would sing Summertime to me. You know, summertime. And so that song is so story-like. So I think that's my answer. And then the other is that I'm the oldest of two brothers, and I read them stories all the time. And my favorite book to read was Herbert's Hair Raising Adventure, about a lion who gets struck with fire, and he loses his mane. So it's really good. It's a great story. It's, a, it's beautifully illustrated. Yeah. Uh, my favorite story, does it have to be a story like verbally told to me or can it be like a show or anything? Everything starts out as a story. This is true. Okay. Um, I, I didn't get a, I can't remember off the top of my head if I had a lot of stories told to me from like my parents, but my favorite story of all time is um, Avatar The Last Airbender. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It is the oh Lord, speak in our language. It's the best show ever. If you haven't seen it, please watch it and don't let the animation, um, you know, turn you off from it. It's the best show ever, and all the themes that they touch on in it. Like I've gained so many life lessons in watching that growing up. Um, a story is about you know how people can be impacted by war. You know how how war can. Um, put the strife between ourselves and the environment mm -hmm. and just the ramifications of war on, you know, multiple different communities and also just the artistry of the fighting styles. It's a very martial arts focused show and I absolutely love it. Favorite story <laughs> of all time. Oh. Katara. Katara. Oh. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Uh, I would I would have to say the, um, Dr. Seuss, one fish, two fish, three fish, four fish. Uh, that those are those are uh, uh, easy stories or are uh, limerick stories. The the animation, the drawings, not animation, but the, the drawings that the man had way back when he was ahead of his time. I believe they wouldn't uh, publish him because they were so controversial, so uh, different. But then, you know, the, as the years passed and uh, how he got into libraries and how he got into uh, uh, the people's minds. And so those are some of the best stories that are around. Dr. Seuss. Anyone else? We still have time. And you're still seat belted in, so I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Oh, I've got that one over there. He then did his little bit on that. Uh, yes. Oh, my question is: um, In different professions, I've had, um, you know, making, uh, creating presentations, facilitations, training. I use mind mapping to do that. I'm kind of curious what you use to put your stories together, and um, any tips that you have on doing that. Um, so, I similar to what you're teaching. Uh, this is for everyone. The Goodman Theater has an, uh, in Chicago has an online storytelling class that you can take for free. The next, uh, the next round starts in a couple weeks. So I took that class, and that helped me realize a lot of what you said today in terms of mapping a beginning, a middle, and end, um, and to use voice. I heard you, you know, using voice softly, short. You know, like, so I was looking to include all of those tactics, and then also... Uh, because I'm a writer, like using words that I love, but wasn't weren't so bogged down in like writing, but could be s 
spoken, if that makes sense, like simple words. So simplicity, slowing down, um, um, beginning, middle, and end, and some sort of drama is what I use to map out the story. Yeah, I'm no expert in this <laughs> type of storytelling. Like I said earlier, my a, a lot of my stories I tell are just presenting my scientific results. But it turns out there's actually a lot of overlap with presenting your science and you know presenting a story. You want to have um, like an interesting opener, I guess, a nice outline you follow, a good middle, um, maybe drama in there. You could have some controversial science opinions in there or something. But yeah, I, I definitely have to take notes of you know the more experienced storytellers here. But yeah. Now I. Um I spent hours and on the computer uh, when I was putting my children's book and my coloring book together. Um, there is a there is a thing, you know, when you when you're when you're researching all this, because I, I illustrated, I authored, illustrated, self-published my books. I am a um, graduate of the Children's Authors Academy. I received a first responders scholarship through them, so uh, I had my um, my sense of duty was to make them proud of what what they gave me. You know, and and I, I put it forward. I did get bogged down on the um, the spacings and the book designing. You you I, I contracted a book uh, designer, a, a student there at ASU, and uh, she said, okay, uh, uh, I'll help you with this. I'll help you with this. The uh, the intricacies because um, it has to be within uh, eighth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. If it's off just a little bit, uh, uh, KD, KDP will. Push, push your book back, and then you got to resubmit everything again. I did that four times. I said, you know what? You have to know when you got to ask for help, and that's something that uh, 2020 uh, uh, taught me to do. So part of the um, what they were saying also is like you do you have the five P's in a sense: the person, the place, the problem, the progress, and then the point of the story. And as you're telling a story, you have to make sure you understand your audience. And if you're in a safe space to tell it, like Louie got emotional, right? But we knew he was okay. We knew he was safe. We knew that I wasn't going to leave here and worry about his emotional state when he left. So you have to be a responsible person when you're telling a story. And that goes for who you are and your listeners. And then the topic, if it's inappropriate, why, are you, why do you want to tell it? What is the purpose of telling it? And with each of them, they, um, the crafting, they don't even realize for, you know, the flow of the stories were excellent. The pacing was really good because you do want to bring those emotions. You do want to bring the facts and the personality, right? Like all of you had different elements, but you also had some of the same elements. So and when you're doing a PowerPoint, just remember, I can read all this. I can read every single thing one plus one equals two. But why is that important that that's behind me? Tell me the story about why plus one plus two, or one plus one equals two. Why are you trying to sell me that story, right? So that's what I would say. Any other questions? <laughs> you have a really good question. I have one. Is anyone inspired now to tell their own story? Yeah! yeah. It looks like there's a place to do it. <laughs> now, is anybody going to the uh, Pat Tillman race tomorrow? <laughs> Yes, there we go. Yeah, yeah. This will be my twentieth race. Oh, we'll uh, oh 18th, because I, I did two virtual ones. We, I, I was there at that very first inception. Like I said, I was, I've been there thirty years. I knew the the man, Pat Tillman, uh, Jake Plummer, uh, Keith Poole. Uh, just as a university uh, work order basis, no, no uh, friendship. You know, it was just work order basis. But the shenanigans that happened there was. <laughs> I got some stories about those. <laughs> Um, for, oh God, I'm so bad with names. Um, so thank you for being a firefighter. Um, you're welcome. I'm a military vet. Louie, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being a firefighter. I'm a military vet. So thank you for that. Thank you for your service. And, um, for all of you, I, I've been trying for years to, come up with like to write like children's stories especially interactive ones because like when I tell my stories I bebox in it so I want to put that in the storytelling book do any of you have any advice for any one of us who want to tell 
uh, who want to write children's stories or just want to write a book? I take this one. Oh, yeah. Very good question. Uh, my my book is uh, it's not a bedtime story. It's the story you read before the bedtime story. The reason being uh, that buzzword that you said, the interactive part. Uh, I have a part in my book is an interactive part. Um, when, when you're reading my book to children, school children, or what have you, there, there's a part in it that says, uh, if you want to go or grow up big and strong, eat your, f eat your fruits and vegetables like broccoli. And on the bottom it says, please have everybody repeat, ew, broccoli. So everybody, ew, broccoli. So that, that brings everybody into your, your little circle. And uh, um, I was telling uh, um, Pepper here a little while ago about the state fair. Uh, I was very apprehensive when they called me up to the stage and I had a competition. Incidentally, I, I won it. Um, it was mostly adults. And I was, I was like, oh, man. What am, and, you know, my book is designed for children. So I, I did, uh, I was honest and uh, up front. I told everybody in the audience, I said, please help me with this. Uh, when I give you the sign, feel free to interact because this was meant for your children, not you guys. <laughs> But anyway, the, the children were having fun, you know, on the rides and what have you. But to my amazement, the adults were having just as much fun. It was, it was like, okay, there, there's something here. But yes, interactive is the way to go, definitely. And to, um, for writing a book, number one, just do it. As you can see, Louie, just do it. You may not know exactly what you're doing still. Just do it. Number two, you can, you can um, he mentioned KDP, which is um, Amazon's uh, publishing arm, basically. Um, you can go through there for self-publishing. There's other routes as well, but essentially, just do it. And find some help, right? Like, find an illustrator. He did it on his own because he is, but just you, once you start the ball rolling, you will find the people that you need. But essentially, and he, you joined the Children's, what was it called? Uh, Children's Authors Academy. So things like that, and get into, the, get into those rooms and those organizations that can help you find what you need, so and then just do it. Sorry. Uh, something, something that came out of that, and, and before, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Uh, never defer your dream. Yes. Do not defer your dream. Questions? Hello. Hi. My question is, uh, given you all have clearly distinct styles, right, uh, to what extent do you each feel uh, maybe somewhere on the spectrum between comfortable or natural or conversational, and, uh, not to conflate the three, uh, versus uh, perhaps performative or, or even rehearsed or, or whatever other spin you'd like to put on the difference between your storytelling mode uh, versus you know, your day-to-day -day or your, your maybe baseline state. That's a yeah, there is a lot there. That's a good question. Well, first of all, we were told we had to, re we had to memorize. Like we, we, we are, you're not, you can't bring up the paper. So part of that was then we had to rehearse, like we had to be prepared in that sense. And then I think for me, because I have an acting background, I did, it, it was performative because that's how I tell stories. Do you know what I mean? If I'm answering your question prop or in the way that you asked it. So for me, I knew that I was going to be performing, but I was still incredibly nervous and I knew I had to remember all the stuff you know, and so I didn't want it to be performative. And then sometimes I broke, like when I asked, does anyone live in Prague? Like, and so I took, I went away from my script so that I could connect with you guys. And then I went back to what, to the storytelling, which for me was performative. Um, hmm. I, yeah, like you were saying, we had to sort of rehearse everything. So I feel like it might, be intrinsically more performative because of that reason. Um, I'd like to, my goal with these in the future, hopefully I get to do something like this again, is to feel very natural in how you come off. Like one thing that comes to mind is when you go see a comedian, you, and you watch them, it doesn't seem like they've rehearsed anything. It seems like they're just having a conversation with their friend. And that, to me, that's like the ultimate goal. Right. Um, with me, it was uh, it was an actual 
life happenstance that, that just uh, um, evolved right in front of my face. And uh, here I was thrusted upon to uh, do something and, and actually uh, help people in a, in a way that I never even dreamed of doing or being able a few years ago. So the beauty of storytelling is, especially when it's your own personal story, I don't know it. And if you miss a part, I still won't know it because it's your story. So there's no wrong or right way in how you're going to tell it. So that's why it's not necessarily about memorization of it or because you've lived it. So if you read it once, if you read your, if you read your story once because she typed it up, it's in her. It's her core. So when she's going to perform it tonight like she did, she's going to perform it again tomorrow. It's going to be a different story because it's a different perspective and a different time, right? Same, same, same um, concept enjoy. that you want. Yeah, and you want us to enjoy. So I suggest everyone just tell a story and live it. And I would like to personally thank um, the crew here for putting up such a great oh, place for us definitely. to tell our stories and gatherings. And meeting these brilliant storytellers tonight and also allowing us to take some of your personal time. And, and here at the Gathering of Storytelling is just a beautiful place. Now, if you want some more information, you go to ASUKERR at dot com and for different uh, events at this venue. And um, June 12th, another brilliant day, another new theme about dad and father, uh, dad and father figures. So hopefully you get to come back and enjoy that. And thank you so much, and we appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, just, just real quick, uh, the next 10 people that line up over here will get a free uh, book. Big love. Nice. Don't toilet paper? Don't toilet paper? No, that was mine. <laughs>